for the past um, three weeks. This is week four. This is the, the finale, the conclusion, the grand. Uh, think of it as, you know, we've been watching the Indy race, and we've been going around in circles. Man, we're, we're getting into the final 500 laps now. No, I'm just joking. I'm not a big fan of the Indy race. I, would, I did that for time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> there is one service every single year that John misses. And it's when when the race is on. That one Sunday every single year, like clockwork. <laughs> and so I felt like I... What? Oh, sorry, three races. To me, it's 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 like one big blur, you know. <laughs> I'm joking again, joking. All right, let's go ahead and get going on this. Um, so we talked in the first time that how religion dresses us to look better than others, but God don't, tells us to dress in patience and love, like Colossians 3 says. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. And then the second week, we talked about how religion prizes titles and riches, how it's all about me being honored. But God prizes people. Like Philippians 4, 1 says, you are my crown. The people that Paul was ministering to was his crown. And the riches that we will get in heaven aren't going to be piles of gold. <laughs> They're going to be blessings beyond comprehension. That tells me that things aren't going to be the same there as they are here. Which is another little warning why we shouldn't take things down here to be too important. Deal with stuff that needs to get done. You know, work hard, do all that kind of stuff. Yes, but just remember that the problems that fill your mind down here aren't going to be so much a thing up there. So, uh, Okay, and then uh, last week we talked about, which was the third week, we talked about how religion loves to invent new biased roles. You know, it's okay for me to do this, but it's wrong for you to do that. And uh, God instead shows us his standard of living. And so that's kind of brought us to now. And uh, there's a lot of things that we could say. And so I, I, I've instead, of, I, I've chosen to kind of outline a few of them here. Religion says that nothing, yeah, that's really small. I didn't look that small on my computer. I'm really sorry. Uh, religion says nothing you do is good enough. You always have to work harder. You always have to do better. You know, you always have to do more and do more to earn your salvation. You, you gotta, you gotta keep, you know. It's nothing you do is good enough. Then the next thing religion tells you is be judgmental and critical of yourself, of others, just tear people down all the time. Because there's this this man-made standard that we all have to, you know, pursue. Religion tells us, yeah, yeah, you have to work for your salvation because you're not good enough. And uh, you just have to keep on trying and keep on trying. And eventually, if you do good enough, you'll, you'll, you'll deserve it. Then God will owe you salvation because you deserve it. Religion tells us, I've done enough. You know, okay, I don't have to minister to people who are less fortunate than me anymore because, you know what, I've done enough in my life. Remember five or ten years ago when I did that one thing? Ah, that's good enough. I don't have to be involved in ministry anymore. Uh, religion tells us, hey, look what I did. Look at how I did this good thing. So that means you can't ever correct me on anything because I did that one good thing on that one time. I'm good enough. And ch with for religion, church is a duty. You go because you don't want people to not like you. You don't want people to get mad at you. So you go because you have to. And it's a thing that I have to do. But in contrast to all these different things, which are oftentimes contradictory, if you notice, mm -hmm. God tells us something a little bit different. We say nothing you do is good enough. That's what religion tells us. But God says it doesn't matter. It was never about you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that solves that. Religion tells us to be judgmental and critical of everything. God tells us do everything as to God. Love others as God loves you. Religion tells us, hey, you have to do work for your salvation. God says, trust in me. I got this. Religion says, I've done enough. I can sit down on my haunches and just kind of chill out here. God says, you were bought with a price, and your life is mine. And I'll let you finish when I tell you to finish. <laughs> we like to say, oh, I can retire from ministry. I don't have to love and serve people now because I'm whatever, fill in the blank. And God says, no. Uh, if I wanted you to not do ministry, you'd be dead. Religion says, hey, look what I did. God says, I am doing something. Get on board. I'm doing something. You're, you're going to miss out. You need to get on board. I'm doing something. God's not going to stop his plans for Tularosa just because you don't want to get on board. He'll do it with or without you. The question is, do you want to get involved? Do you want to see what, how he can change a life? 
Or do you want to sit in the back? I, I don't mean literally for all those people sitting in the back. <laughs> Religion tells us, I'm good enough. You know, I, whatever. And God says, I forgive you. I don't need your forgiveness, God. I'm good enough. Okay, keep telling yourself that. Religion tells us church is a duty, but, oops, sorry. But God tells us church is a joy. He gave us the gift of, of, of uh, church so that we won't miss out. We can do more together. God never intended for people to live their lives by themselves in isolation. Chuck talked about this last uh, Sunday morning, I, I think, um, about how, you know, loneliness and, and stuff. Anyways, um, so I, I just to kind of drive the point home, let me kind of tell you a short story about two men, and, and I'll just ask you a very short question. There was one man who adopted a boy. Now, he didn't do anything for the boy. He never took the time to spend with the boy. He just adopted him and said, hey, I've adopted him. That selfish little brat needs to get his act together. I've sacrificed a lot to adopt him. Whereas this other guy, he never adopted anyone, but he always had the attitude, if only I could do more. So out of the two men, which one was more righteous? The one who didn't adopt a child or the one who did? The one who didn't. You see? And why is that? Because the heart is what matters. And when you have the heart, God, teach me. Pastor talked about this morning in, in Job. God, teach me. I don't have all the answers. God, teach me. And when you go to God with the attitude of God, what can I do more? Did you know that not everybody in the world can adopt? Did you know that? There are some people who have the means to, and if you do, then I encourage you to. But not everybody can do that. Does that mean that God loves you less if you are serving lesser of a ministry because you can't do the exact same ministry as somebody else? No. See, I mean, because in the end, it was between you and God. And did you have the attitude of a religious person? I have done enough. Or did you have the attitude of someone who wants more of God? Did you have the attitude of someone who wanted more of God? And that's really at the heart of everything that we've been talking about with religion. Everything comes down to this. The outlook that you have. Is it one of religion that leads to death or one of loving God that leads to life? Jesus even told a story about two separate men and how they prayed to God. And one was a religious leader he was really looked up to. And he said, God, thank you that I'm not like this other guy. You know, you, I don't struggle with the same things as, as this dirty little heathen over here. You, you, you've made me, you, 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 you've, man, you, you really brought me to a place of being hired to this person. Thank you for that, God. Thank you that I don't struggle with the same things as this dirty alcoholic or, or dirty drunk, you know, dirty uh, uh, drug addict. Uh, you know, thank you that I'm not like them. Thank you that I'm, that I'm better. Thank you that I don't need help. And on the other side, there's this, this little guy in the corner just, you know, minding his own business saying, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Which one was more righteous? The one who was a religious leader and looked up to by the whole community? Or the little guy in the corner? See the difference? Religion tells us me. God tells us me. See the difference? Religion focuses on self. God focuses on him. And the more you focus on God, the, the smaller your problems will seem. So we're going to look at James chapter two, chapter 1, verse 26. One single verse. Um, this is kind of the conclusion of everything that we've been talking about. So I didn't want to just re reiterate the same thing over and over again. Um, James chapter 1, verse 26. It says this. It says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Do you know how many churches I've been to where there's people who've been in that church for 50 years, no new membership in 20, and all they do is talk about stuff. They have committees to talk about stuff. And then they have committees to discuss whether the committees are doing a good job. And then they have people who talk about the people on the committee because they're not doing a good enough job and I can do a better job. 
And then they run the church out and the pastor out of town because he's not doing it the way that I would. So then they get a new pastor in, and he's fine for about a week or two until he starts wanting to do things his own way. And well, darn it, we're just not going to have any of that here. Let's run him off too. See the difference in perspective. But that's not a church. That's a religion. That's a building full of club members. Those aren't God's seekers. And that's what I'm trying to get across with this series that we've been talking about. Religion is often at odds with God. Don't listen to the way you've always heard it. Listen to what God says, how it actually is. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue... But to seek his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Worthless. So the first thing I want to uh, point out in this verse, it says, bridle the tongue. Basically what that means is control what is said. That's a simple way of saying it. Um, this, would, this would mean, so you're not gossiping about people. You're not talking about people behind their back. You're not uh, slandering. You're not tearing people down. You're not lying about people. Um, you're not spreading being a, a false witness, that kind of stuff. And I actually, um, I actually have some pictures. Uh, welcome back to this, but I have some pictures I want to get to. In, in, the, in years past, they had this thing right here, which I it's drawn, drawn a blank. Um, ah. Muzzle. Muzzle. No, it's not called a muzzle. Um, it was actually it was this device that they used to shame, to publicly shame, um, usually women. Uh, and it's strapped around their head like a muzzle. It basically is a muzzle, but there's actually a specific name for it. Um, where they, well, you can see it, it, it covers their mouth. It was a form of, of, of light torture or public shaming, uh, that kind of thing. Um, in more recent news, there was this woman that was in the newspaper that, um, she does that on purpose. I don't know, there's, I guess there's some people with crazy things that they like to do, and this woman likes to dress up like a horse, so whatever. Uh, she even has a saddle on, man. That must have been an expensive outfit. But anyways, do you see this in her mouth? This is called a bridle. That's what that is. So now, let's read that again. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, that. The first step <laughs> to getting past religion and getting to God is to close your mouth. Close your mouth. There's sometimes when we just kind of let the stupid things that go through our heads instantly come out of our uh, instantly come out of our mouths, and you just have to stop and wonder for a second: Is this a good idea? Should I be saying this thing? Because it, maybe it's not such a great idea. And James even says that it's a defining trait between religion and pressing into God. If anyone thinks himself to be religious. And yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. Those are some strong fighting words where I come from. James evidently was never out west. Uh, so the second thing that he says, he deceives his heart. Now, how do you deceive your own heart? He is specifically talking about Christians. All throughout the book of James, he constantly references what Jesus said at a certain point. It, it was called his, his Sermon on the Mount. Not really what we're going to be talking about tonight, but um, he consistently references things that Jesus said. And one of the things that Jesus said was, from the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, if you are a believer, you have a new heart. So if you are saying things that do not match that what God has put in your heart, you are deceiving your heart. That's how we know he's specifically talking about believers. He's not talking about people in the world. He's talking about believers. So he's saying, hey, Christians, if you think you really got your stuff together, but you can't keep your mouth shut, your religion is worthless. Whoa, them are some fighting words here, James. We need to have a draw here and see how this ends. And then the third thing that he says, so bridle his tongue, deceives his heart. The third thing, worthless. So and there you go. From the heart, come blessing and cursing. So we're talking about fruitless religion, something that doesn't, doesn't produce anything. And the last thing here um, is at the end of the verse there, this man's religion is worthless. Now, the word worthless means literally idle. Like, have you ever popped your car out of gear and put it into neutral? Just kind of sits there. You can rev it all you want. You're not going anywhere. Um, idle, another word, would be fruitless. 
Another word that defines this word, I like this one, powerless. Your religion is powerless. You know that old hymnal song, um, there's power in the blood? Not if you're not keeping your mouth shut. Another word, lacking truth. These are all, thi all things that describe that, that one word that's translated as worthless. And uh, I wrote this down. It was a quote from, um, I wish I could remember. I, I'm sorry, I really do not. I don't like to quote things unless I remember the sources, but I can, if anybody's real interested, I'm sure I can find it again. It says, the witness we have, we, I'm sorry, we give by our casual speech speaks volumes about the value of our belief. I'll say that again because it's a little bit, a little bit long. The witness we give by our casual speech, the things that we say, okay, it speaks volumes about the value of our belief. If we want God to take, a, if we want people to take God seriously, yeah, I said that right. If you, if we want God to take, if we want people to take God seriously, <laughs> we have to be people who aren't spouting off nonsense all the time, right. because the things that we say show how much we value our beliefs. Do you really value God enough to stop gossiping about people? Do you value God in your life enough to stop lying about people? Do you value a God enough to allow it to change you? Or is it an empty belief? And that is the difference between religion and seeking God. Oh, I believe in God, but I don't live his ways. Oh, I believe in God, but I still talk bad about other people behind their backs. Oh, I believe in God, but I don't love people. Well, then you don't love God. Because if you don't love your brother and you say that you love God, you're a liar. The Bible says that. Remember that. So if you got a bad attitude towards somebody, it's time to get over it. And uh, let's see, next, next thing I want to say, don't believe everything you hear. There was, an old, there was an old song that somebody mentioned a few months ago, and I think it just bears repeating. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Some of these kids' songs, I think we should relearn as adults. I really yes. think that they haven't lost their place um, at all. Um, like, for instance, I heard somebody saying some very racist things, and I don't really want to get into that. Um, but I just thought about that, that child song about um, Jesus loves little children, red, and yellow, black, and white. I just thought, you know, when did you forget about that song there, buddy? And, uh, you know, then this, again, the whole thing with gossiping and religion and that kind of stuff... Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. I mean, those are things that it never loses its its um its uh, its place in our lives. I had a friend on Facebook who posted something about. It. She said it may sound childish, but uh, if you don't have anything nice to say, I, I just wish that person wouldn't have said anything at all. And I said, that's something that doesn't go away with age. That's something to always remember, no matter how old you get. You don't outgrow that one. And uh, so just a few more things. Romans chapter 1. Um, and you don't have to turn here if you don't want to. It's whatever. If I can actually turn to the page. There we go. Romans chapter 1. Verse 28 through 32 says this. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved mind. To do, the, to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, <clears throat> deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So here we're talking about religion versus seeking God. And one of the things that religion tells us is, my sin is so much better than you, it's okay that I'm gossiping because I'm not hurting anybody. Did you just hear what Paul said? Did you just hear it? Because he talked about people who don't listen to their parents. He talked about people who gossip and slander. It was all there. 
See what I mean? But we, we like to partition in our mind. Religion causes us to put up little boxes in our mind. This sin is okay. This one, not so much. This one's bad. Okay. This one's okay. This one's okay. This one's bad. See what I mean? And the truth is, all sin separates us from God. All of it. It's a package deal. Not all sin is equal, and different sins are punished differently. But all sins do separate us from God equally. Um, a few last things. Is your mouth always open? Are you always stirring the pot? I want to show you these pictures one more time. I want you to remember. Oh, I want you to remember this. What you've got going on there. Every time you're around your family or saying something on Facebook or doing something stupid, I want you to just verbally, and not verbally, mentally put that sucker on your mouth. You know, I'm putting it on it, like throwing away the key. Because you don't have to say something stupid. It's okay to keep your mouth shut. It's okay. All right? Worst comes to worst, they think you're stupid, but it's okay if you, if you stay, long, stay quiet for long enough, they'll start thinking, hey, maybe this guy isn't stupid. Maybe he's smarter than I thought he was. But if you open your mouth, they'll know that you're stupid. See, that's a lose-lose situation right there. Uh, anyways, uh, so just a few a few final things here. Um, the next verse there in James 1 is uh, verse 27. And uh, I wanted to read it just because I think it gives a nice little touch to this. Uh, it says, pure and undefiled religion. This is what we've been looking for, this pure and undefiled religion, this seeking after God. Okay, give, give it to us, James. And the sight of our God and Father is this. Okay, God, we're listening. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So that's a twofold kind of command, if you would, or, or, or encouragement, whatever, however you want to say it. First off is showing love, unconditional love to others. Now he uses the example specifically of orphans and widows, but it goes far beyond that. He's not saying just orphans and widows, just so you don't know. He's picking out two people in his culture that were largely ostracized, largely overlooked, largely uncared for. So think of, real quick, people in your community who are largely overlooked, like drug guys. See what I mean? Because we don't have the same culture as back then, and we don't have, they didn't have welfare like we do now, and there's just a whole lot of other things there. Um, so, okay, so the first thing he says, showing unconditional love to others. And the second thing that he says, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In other words, obey God. That simple. Religion emphasizes us, it, appear, it emphasizes our appearance, our preferences, our pride, our knowledge, our goodness, and in doing all these things, we find death. Religion promises the, us the hope of being better, but all it delivers is a chain. That's all it ever delivers. I, th I, I think of I think of the uh, the story written by um, it was it's called a Christmas Carol. Um, Charles Dickens, yes. I think of the story written by Charles Dickens where he says about this, about you know the guy who had died, the business partner who had died, and he says, these chains I forged in life. That's what religion does. It, forge, it, it forges chains that we're binding to ourselves, and we think we're making ourselves better than someone else. We think that we have it all together and we don't need anybody's help, but the truth is we're just working ourselves deeper into a hole. And the whole time, God's trying to say, okay, that's, that's not what I said, though. You, you need to come over here. Just come over here. But the whole time, we're saying, no, God, I got this all together. I don't need you to teach me. I know what the heck I'm doing. But what did Job say in the sermon this morning? Teach me. Teach me, God. Just teach me. These things that I thought I, thought I knew, and I, I, I didn't. I, I didn't. Teach me, God. Don't lose that. That's what separates religion from seeking God. I have the answers versus you have the answers. There's a complete different change. And the thing is, is it comes on you very, very suddenly. You'll be seeking after God. Your, your life will be all going good and everything. And then somewhere along the line, you start taking these little baby steps towards being self-sufficient. 
I don't need God anymore. I've got my prayer life together. I've got my little schedules. That I, I mean, I'm, I'm doing everything great. And then before we know it, we're way over in left field. And God's throwing, uh, throwing balls right down the middle. What are you doing over there? I'm throwing the balls over here, buddy. Come on. <laughs> but we don't see what's going on because we're so focused on what we're doing. But God, I've gotten really efficient. Really efficient. Well, I'm glad you're being so efficient at doing the wrong thing, but I would really like it if you just humble your heart. Can God tell you something and you say, okay, I'm listening? Or do you instantly dismiss it and say, no, I've got it together. I got this. I got this. No. Religion emphasizes us and it delivers only death. God wants us to dress ourselves in Him, in His love, reach out to others, learn His ways, and in doing those things, we find life, we find joy, we find blessings, and we find contentment. So dress in love and kindness. Don't seek your glory. Live God's ways. Confront your thoughts with God's ways. That summarizes everything that I just that, that we've been talking about for the past couple weeks. And the last verse there is, I think, the one that is the single greatest. Um, cure for religion. It says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how the heck are you going to renew your mind? Religion won't get you there. God will. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And I think that that verse puts a nice little ribbon on, on, the, on the top of that cake. I mean, man, it just really, that's a birthday cake that I want. Don't put, never mind, I don't, I don't want a ribbon on, on my birthday cake. I think it would probably smash it. Um, how about instead, you should, night icing. That's the icing on the cake right there. Yeah, keep, keep, keep the ribbons off my birthday cake. If you make me a birthday cake this year, uh, Melissa, I'm looking at you. Uh, don't, don't put a ribbon on the top. Scratch the ribbon. That was a bad idea. Um, but we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, I hope that there are no questions because I really feel like, you know, when somebody's trying to hit a nail with a hammer and they hit all around the nail and the wood's all dinged up and it's got potholes in it and stuff and finally they hit the nail and it looks all nasty and you gotta smooth it over with some drywall because of how terrible it I feel like that's what we've done over the past four weeks. I feel like we've hit this thing from every angle possible. So just in case you missed anything, religion bad, God good. Amen. Seek God and seek him with your whole heart and let him take care of the rest. Uh, can I have